The Ready to Learn Learning Triangle is a teaching tool. It addresses various learning styles and engages different senses. This workshop is based on these principles, view, read, and do. Today we're going to talk about the best way to help children learn. And I think most of you, if you're a parent like me, is what are some things that I can do so my children will be ready for school? Okay, so when we talk about being ready for school, what are some things that they need to know before they enter kindergarten? Can you think of anything, Mary, that your child needs to know before they go to school? Um, I think that they need to be able to count up to like 10 or 20. Okay. They need to be able to recognize letters of the alphabet. Um, so some cognitive and reasoning skills they need, okay? Yeah. So, Rachel, can you think of anything that maybe you needed to know or your little sisters um, needed to know before they went to school? Probably social things. Okay. How to, how to get along with the other kids <laughs> and how to deal with being away from home. And All right. That is a big one. I know as a mom, sending those kids to school, that's a, it's hard to, to do that. Wow. And this was not scripted, but each of you hit on an area of development. Our cognitive reasoning skills, our social and emotional skills, um, our language skills, and then our fine motor skills. All of those are what we call um, areas of domain, how children learn. And we're going to talk about how we can encourage children to learn today and the best things that we can do to help them so when they go to school that they're ready to learn in all of the four areas of development. Now one thing that we need to understand is we call child development holistic. That means that if you are um, up to speed in your reasoning cognitive skills, you'll probably be up to speed in your social and emotional skills and physical. Now, can you think of a real shy child if they were having some issues socially, why would that hold them back in maybe a physical area? Anybody, Rachel, can you think of why that would hold them back physically if they're very shy? Um, they may be afraid to try anything. Okay. They may be afraid to try something new or or do it wrong so they won't want to try to do okay. it in front of people. So research says that child development is holistic, that we develop all three areas usually at the same stage, at the same speed. But once again, think of your own children. I have a child that is great socially, needs a little help maybe with those cognitive reasoning skills. And so as we think of this, we also have to think individually too about our children. Now I'm gonna give you some examples of how children learn. And to do that, I just have a little activity that we're gonna try. And I want you to look at this very small representation of something. And I want you to call out as loud as you can so we can hear you, everything you see about this object. Anything you see. It's shiny. It's shiny. Blue. It's blue. It's round. It's, round. it's kind of see-through. It's kind of see-through. Does it, is it supposed to represent something? The moon, a planet, a planet. Now, probably because you're far away, this planet actually has rings. Saturn. Okay, so now we're getting into, oh, this is a planet. It's not just a round, shiny piece of plastic that it actually is supposed to represent something. Now, I'm not trying to embarrass any of you, but this planet is actually Uranus and not Saturn. Now, I want to tell you something that I learned teaching this workshop is one time I had someone say to me, well, I think it's Uranus, but that you don't have it at an angle so the rings are not horizontal like Saturn is. So if you would have been holding it different, I would have said Uranus. Plus the color of Saturn is usually yellow. And she just went on and on and on. I'm like, how do you know all this? And she said, oh, I study planets. It's one of my hobbies. And that's what we're gonna talk about is most of us knew sort of what it, that was supposed to represent. That it was some kind of planet, the moon or something in our solar system. And that's what we call assimilation to accommodation. Now, when children first start to learn, and adults actually, is we take whatever is similar. Oh, it's round, it's blue. We all know that, so we take what we already know, and that's called assimilation. And then we start looking for the details of it 
till we've accommodated it, or what I like so to help me remember this, is till we're very comfortable with it, till we know it. That's accommodation. Now, the lady that explained to me, oh, you're not holding it at the right angle. It's not the right color. She had accommodated the planets. And that's how we always learn. Think about it. If you were, if I was explaining how to get here today and I said to Candace, well, do you know where such and such place is? You take what you already know, you assimilate it, and then I start giving you the details until you understand it completely. If you drive home, no one has to tell you where to go. In fact, sometimes you might get there and you think, how did I get here? That's accommodation. I like to say accommodation is something that you could teach someone else. If you sew and you're good at it and you could teach someone else, you've usually accommodated it. Now let's think of children. A children start out with so much information and so many, um, they don't have a lot of experiences that sometimes their assimilation is very difficult for them. And we think, oh, those kids don't know anything. But in fact, they really have great reasoning skills, such as, do any of you have um, children that call every meat a certain thing? What is it, Liz? Everything is steak. Everything steak? Yeah. Wow, at your house it's steak. <laughs> Anybody have everything is chicken? Everything is chicken. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about my grandson. He came over for Easter dinner. What's a typical Easter meat, Teresa? Ham. ham. And we were having ham, okay? And so um, my grandson looked at it and he said, I don't like pink chicken. <laughs> I said, it's not pink chicken, this is ham. Now I didn't wanna tell him where it came from because that might even make him not wanna eat it more. But I said, it's sweet and I put brown sugar and honey on it, it's really good. And so he took a bite. Well, all day long he kept coming up to me and saying, can I have some more of that pink chicken? <laughs> and you know, I thought he's gonna go home and tell his mom I fed him pink chicken all day. But that's what assimilation is, is where they take something that they already know a name of meat and every other meat is chicken. Now I know with my own kids growing up they did that with people and a lot of us as mothers don't like it when they say oh hi mommy or have any of you had this experience where they've seen someone said hi grandpa <laughs> you know and that really isn't their grandpa. That is very normal and actually when a child's doing that you might not think oh what's wrong with my child you start to think wow look at my child is looking at a certain thing and they understand Understand what category it goes into. Now, how can we help a child? Because we don't want our children to be calling a cow, I mean, if it's a horse, a cow, you know. We want them to know that the difference, what the differences are. And the best thing you can do is take what they already know and then point out the differences. Such as if somebody was saying, hi, grandpa, to someone, in my case, I would say, Oh, well, that grandpa has hair on top of his head and our grandpa doesn't. Oh, well, that grandpa doesn't have glasses and our grandpa does. And we start pointing out the differences so the children can go almost down a funnel and start to accommodate new information. The best way that has helped me recognize accommodation and assimilation is think of your recipe box. Now, in my recipe box, I have tons of desserts. <laughs> you know, Not a lot of vegetables in there, but tons of desserts. The more I cook and the more experiences I have with recipes, the larger my file gets where I can actually define them. And that's the same for children. The more experiences they have, real life experiences, the more they're going to learn. Now, I had a professor give us an example of accommodation and assimilation that really has helped me understand it. And the first thing that we need to understand is we can't expect a child to know about the solar system until they know basic shapes and colors and about our own world. And so we take where they're at and we take the information that they already know 
and then we add just a little bit more. That is called sequential order, where they just actually add a little bit more at a time. So you are going to pretend that you're in kindergarten and you each have some um, dough in front of you, okay? Some just little clay. And what I want you to do is pretend you're in kindergarten. Now there's three basic shapes that all children make when they first have clay. And I want to see if we can get those. Oh, Nancy's doing a, a, the snake. So we've got a snake. Okay, we've got, the, and Liz has got a ball, we're doing, oh, and Rachel's got the pancake. Those are the three basic shapes that all children usually do. After they've thrown it at each other, stuck it on the carpet, you know, seen what it could do otherwise. But those are the three basic shapes. Now, if we want to accommodate more information for that children, what we want to do is take those three basic shapes and start making things with it. Now I'm going to, we're going to do just a little example, and as a group, and I will start, we are going to make an elephant. We are going to make an animal only using those three shapes. And I want you to see, and as my professor did this, what he did is to get you guys thinking, so I'm going to treat you maybe like you're a little bit kindergarten, but this is going to be the body of my elephant, and it is supposed to be a ball. Let me get it more smushed together. So here's our body. It's a ball, and so now I need a head. Diana, what would the shape of the head be? be a ball. Another ball. So can, will it be the same size, bigger, or smaller? Okay, so could you hand me a smaller ball so I can make a head for this elephant? Okay, I didn't tell her, but we sort of reasoned together what it would be. Okay, so I've got my head. Now, that does not look like an elephant, does it? Okay, what would the trunk be? Only using those three shapes. A snake, okay. So could someone make, oh, that's too long, isn't it, Nancy? That's a long snake. So um, Liz looks like she's got a trunk for me. Oh, and she even made it a little bit smaller. Still not looking like an elephant. Don't think that looks like an elephant. Yeah. Okay, so what would the ears be? Pancakes. Pancakes. How many pancakes would we need? Two. Two. Okay, so can you see working with children, taking what they already know and adding new information? Who has two pancakes for me? Pam does, and we're having Dumbo today. <laughs> Dumbo the uh, big, big ears. Ooh, hey, is it starting to look like an elephant now? It is. Three shapes, three shapes. Okay, so what will the tail be? Another snake. Another snake. Teeny, tiny, skinny, skinny, right? I think Rachel might have that for me. Teeny, teeny, oh, she had a ball very quickly. Okay, so. It's a snake has a short tail. Okay, what would we're just going to do one leg? What would the leg be? A, a short, fat snake. Huh? Could kids understand that? Okay, a short, fat snake. Now, does it look like an elephant? I was amazed because I was that child in kindergarten that only could make a nest with eggs. I, I couldn't think be what to make. And had I had this information as a five-year-old, I could have started to go, oh, I need this and this and this. Now, another thing my professor said that I didn't really listen to is he said, even though a child can have all that information, if they don't want to, if they don't want to make a zoo animal, they're not going to. Well, I rushed home from that class to my five-year-old daughter. And all of a sudden, I got out our clay and I said, we're going to make zoo animals. And she looked at me and she's, no thanks. And so she's playing with her little dolls. And so I said, come on, let's make zoo animals. We're going to take the three shapes you know where we're going to make zoo animals. No, thank you looking at me like, go away, I'm a little busy here. And so finally I said, can I make food for your dolls? And she's like, yeah. And I said, okay, how do we make a hot dog? And so she said, oh, make a pancake and put a snake in the middle and fold it. That's assimilation to accommodation. And that's how children learn, is by adding one thing. Now I saw some of you before we started actually taking it and making your ball into a cube. That would be something else that you could teach. 
But we don't start with a cube. We start with what they already know and add a little bit more. Isn't that interesting? And isn't that how we all learn? So as you teach children in all areas that they develop, start with what they know and then just add a little bit more. And that will be the perfect way for them to learn. Another difference we know about children is their brains are developing and they're not developed like ours are. So we're going to talk about brain development, how they're different from our brains, and some things that maybe will help you understand your children a little bit so when you're working with them you don't get as frustrated. And you can say, oh, that's because their brains are not developed yet, or that's because. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our Play-Doh, and now because you're past kindergarten, most of you are past kindergarten, we're going to make some other shapes. And there's three shapes that you're going to make. What we're going to do with our Play-Doh is we're going to make a representation of a brain neuron, okay? And so about what a brain neuron is, what their functions are, and what we can expect from children with their brain development. Now with your Play-Doh, this um, Play-Doh is going to become the cell body of the neuron. Now just like your body, it houses everything, it connects everything together. And for this particular neuron, it can either be a star shape, a pear shaped or a pyramid shape. So I want you to take your Play-Doh and make it one of those shapes. I usually take a star because once again that's the easiest and I just take mine and then in your baggie right in front of you you have some other items that will be a representation of um, your brain neuron. So this is the cell body. Remember, um, it's what houses everything else. It's what stores everything. As you've gotten those, um, one of those three shapes made, I want you to take out, you've got a little Chanel stick in your baggie. And what I would like you to do is take that out and you can just coil it up, wrap it up. And I want you to just stick it right in the middle of your cell body, okay, or your dough. Now this rec represents the nucleus. I don't know if any of you remember your biology classes, what the nucleus does, but it stores the DNA and so it differentiates every, this particular neuron. So it will make it very different from the others. And so that's a very important part because in the brain, everything that our body does um, has a different neuron to make our body work. Now, so we've got it, the, the nucleus, and we've got our cell body. I want you to take your piece of yarn, and it's got a little, lots of little pieces on it. And what I would like you to do is stick it right down so it makes a tail almost, okay? Now, this is called the axon. And what the axon does is it carries the information from the neuron to the different parts of the body. And it can be up to six feet long, depending on where its function needs to go. And um, I like this piece of yarn that we have because it's got a little, lot of little fingers on it. And actually that's how neurons, um, that axons work is they can go different places too. Now if we had more yarn and more time, we would actually stick some out on the top because those would be called dendrites. And that's what receives the information and they might have five or six little fingers that come in and then the axon actually carries the information out so what the function of the brain where it goes to the body will carry it out. Now the next thing, and this is going to be a little hard for you to put on, but if you can you might have to put it up to your lips and suck it on or just look at mine, is the straw. And the straw actually is a fatty acid that covers the axon. And on this one, I just have a piece of it covered. But as a child develops, the whole axon will become what we call myelinated. It's myelinization. And myelinization is a very important thing. And it will help us as parents be a little bit more patient with our children. Because myelinization acts as a insulation. Now in front of us on the floor, not everyone can see it, we have an electrical cord that has some plastic, why, um, plastic covering around it. Teresa, why is that plastic covering on those wires? Um, it insulates it so that the electric electrical impulse 
or electricity stays in that conduit. Yeah, and so it actually goes to the right place. That's exactly the same purpose as myelinization. It makes that current or that the thought or the action make sure it goes to the right place and not short out. Children do not have myelinization yet. In fact, myelinization occurs very, it doesn't have a lot at birth, but as a child does things, the more experience that they have, the more myelinated that particular axon becomes. So the more usage you have of an axon, that's where the first myelinization starts. Now another very, very important part of myelinization is food or nutrition. This fatty acid comes from the breast milk or the formula. And so nutrition for a baby is very, very important. Right now I'm seeing a lot of advertisements for um, brain food almost, as this, this particular food has the source to help with brain development. That's this myelinization. So a healthy, a healthy diet is very important for brain development. And that's why we um, pediatricians usually, now if your pediatrician says something different, please listen to him. But that's why they usually say, please don't give anything low fat or non-fat to a child before two. It's because we want this myelinization to happen. And so children, depending on who you talk to, myelinization is not completely, doesn't complete until about the age, maybe up until 20, depending on when the brain has finished developing. But um, a 12 year old does not have the brain development that an adult does. They do not have the, the thought processes that we do. So it's very important that when you ask a two-year-old to go get his shoes and then he sees that there's some yummy fruit snacks sitting in the kitchen, his thought process splits and that's where he goes. It's very important for you to understand that that's the type of brain development. Remember, nutrition, experience, and love is what helps a brain development develop. Now, I have a clip that I love. I wish that we had time to watch a whole hour of this series, um, but it talks a little bit about brain development. And as you watch it, I want you to think, oh, I didn't know that, or Boy, I forgot that. So as we watch this, look at the neurons and look at the brain development that's going on with children. In order to understand why the first three years in a child's life are so important, it helps to know how the brain develops. We now know, for instance, that uh, young children do indeed have an incredible capacity for learning language and forming relationships, and that those abilities come really on the blueprint of human beings. Recent discoveries in brain technology have given scientists the ability to see just how that blueprint develops. We now know that by the 17th week of pregnancy, a healthy fetus already has over a billion brain cells, more than a fully grown adult. But the cells are not in the right place. It's only after they form that they begin to travel to specific parts of the brain. What you see here is actual footage of migrating cells, something scientists have only recently been able to capture. Once these cells reach their destination, they form connections with other cells called synapses, which control various functions of the brain. By the time we're born, each cell has already made hundreds of thousands of connections, but there's still billions more to be made. From early infancy on into childhood is when brain cells form most of the connections we will keep through life. And what will happen is, based upon a variety of factors, including environmental factors, experience, some of these will die off and some of them will be maintained. And over time, this incredible process of neuronal architecture is, is laid out so that you have a functioning brain. As we mature, the brain physically changes due to outside influences. The most rapid change occurs during the first three years when a child is bombarded with hundreds of new experiences. It is at this point in development that the brain is most flexible and prepared to learn, building new connections where needed and casting off others that aren't used. This ability to rewire itself due to outside influences is what neurologists call 
brain plasticity. It's just incredible. So Nancy, anything you saw that was a, like, oh, I didn't know that, or remind you about, or that was an aha moment maybe for you? Uh, wow, how incredible the human brain is. Yes. Did any of you keep hearing the first three years of life? The first mm -hmm. three years of life is when the brain is most flexible and ready to learn. Now, if you are like me as a mother, and when I first um, started studying this, I thought, oh, have I ruined my children? Oh no, what, what hope do they have for themselves? And I just want you to know that children are very resilient. But having said that, we do know those first three to five years are the best and most appropriate time for children to learn and acquire information. We know in the state of Utah, where we're at right now, is that for every dollar we spend in early childhood education and we can help children learn, if we don't catch a child, then we're going to be spending 10 to $15 down the road to catch up. Can it be done? Yes. Um, are we only talking about money? Here we are, but it's also there's a lot easier chance to help children in those preschool years than there is as they get older. So we're going to do, for the rest of the time, what we're going to do is we're going to take what we've already discussed, that accommodation and assimilation, how children's brains are different from ours, and we're going to talk about the three areas of development and how you as parents and grandparents can help your children have the most success in learning in each area of development. As we talk about child development, one thing that was brought up that I would want to reinforce is we're talking about normal child development. If you have a child that has specific needs, find someone that has a specialty in that area and help them. So as we talk about different areas of development, which are the cognitive and language, the social and emotional, the physical, we're talking about normal behavior and how to help a child. If your child has a special need in any of those areas, please seek help for them. The one thing that's really interesting though is that as you watch a child um, develop in certain areas, you might go, oh, there might be something else wrong, such as when our daughter was learning to jump rope, we kept trying and trying to show her, okay, jump now, jump now, jump now. She just couldn't do it, couldn't do it. All of a sudden we decided, can she not see the rope? Well, maybe we should have taken that note we got from the school and taking it to get her eyes check, which we decided maybe we should do. And so that physical development and that reasoning skill actually had some physical needs that she needed to take care of. So as you work with your children, if they're not up to par with the ages and stages, you might look and see, oh, I wonder what's happening and what we can do to help. So, we are going to talk about specifically each areas of development and we're going to use the learning triangle. We've used that in some of the workshops that we've had previously and some that we'll have after where we actually will take a show and we'll view a certain concept and then we'll review that concept with a book, not the same book, but something that's similar and then we're going to do an activity. Remember the doing is the most important learning part, okay? It's not the watching or the reading the book. It's when you do something is when you really learn. And so we're going to do that in each area of development and talk about how you can help your child in that specific area. And we're going to start with cognitive or reasoning skills. What shows deal with reasoning skills? Most of the PBS shows are going to have some kind of theme that wants a child to learn. Now one of my favorite shows is Sesame Street. My children grew up with it, I grew up with it. We're going to watch a classic video of Cookie Monster looking I for some differences. Okay, here, I help. One of these things is not like the other things. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you guess which thing is not like the other thing? before I finish my song. Now look closely, look. Now something here, one of these things does not belong. Now I'll give you a hint. It has to do with how many cookies are on each plate, okay? You ready? No? Okay, keep looking. I look too. This is hard even for a monster. Keep looking. Oh, did you guess? Oh yeah? Did you guess which thing is not like the other things? 
did you guess with all your might? If you guess that this thing is not like the other things, you know what? You know what? You're right. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're so smart. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Oh, I love Cookie Monster. I have to tell you about that clip is years ago when my daughter first saw it and I was trying to point out the differences, which plate has most, which has different. We got done with that and she looked at me and she said, why is Cookie Monster's eyes on top of his head? <laughs> I said, uh, so he can find cookies really quick. And then I said, so which plate was different? And she said, and this is when she was trying to figure out real and pretend is, is there anything real that has eyes on top of his head? I'm like, did you look at the cookies? <laughs> no, what cookies? She was consumed with the eyes on top of the head. So we took that and I tried to think, what has eyes on top of his head? So you know what? I went to my local library and I went to the children's library and I said, we're looking for real animals that have eyes on top of his head alligator, crocodile. We spent time for the next couple weeks learning about animals that had eyes on top of its head. So the next time we went to the zoo, guess what my daughter did? She found those animals that have eyes on top of its head. One thing that I forget as a parent that I would encourage you to do is sometimes there's so many experiences that children are having, we need to point out what we want them to learn, okay? So if you wanted them, if I, what I should have done is set that up, and that was a great opportunity for learning. So I took it, I don't always do that, but I took that opportunity for my child's development and I helped them in her reasoning skills. The next time we watched it, we particularly talked about cookie monsters like alligators so we can look for cookies really quick. Now look at the cookies. Now that was a sorting type of reasoning skills. And Sesame Street does a very good job because they give children lots of time to look. Okay, so that's why we have quite a bit of time. Now, the book that I'm picking to review this ready to learn um, learning triangle is Caps for Sale. Now, if any of you've read this book, most of you have probably grown up with it. It's a classic book. Doesn't say one thing about sorting, does it? doesn't ever say the word sorting, but there is a peddler that wears some caps on top of his head, and he always has them in a certain color. Well, one day it was quite warm. It was a warm summer day, and he wasn't getting many cells. And so this peddler decided to sit by a tree, and instead of sitting, he took a little nap. And as he napped, he slept and slept, and when he woke up, he went on top of his head and none of his caps were there and he looked up and he looked around and he couldn't find them. Finally he looked way up in the tree and on every branch sat a monkey and on every monkey was a gray, a brown or a blue or red cap. The peddler looked at those monkeys. The monkeys looked at the peddler. He didn't know what to do. Finally, he spoke to them. You monkeys, you, you shaking his finger. You give me back my caps. But the monkeys only shook their fingers at him. So finally, he said, he got so mad. He said, you monkeys, you, you give me their caps. And the monkeys just looked at him and shook their hands like this. The man got so mad that he stamped both of his feet and he said, you monkeys, you, you give me back my caps. And the monkeys just looked at him and stamped their feet and laughed. Oh, that peddler was so angry. He took the last cap on his top of his head and he threw it down. Well, guess what the monkeys did? They took their caps and they threw it down. Oh, luckily that peddler got those back. And so he took every cap and he got all the gray caps, all the brown caps, all the blue caps, and all the red hats, and he put them in order. Putting them on top of the head, he walked slowly back to town yelling, caps for sale, caps for sale, only 50 cents. Okay. Not once did we talk about sorting, but we're introducing the concept right here. A great lesson for kids. Now, we have an activity that each of you will be taking home with you. And um, if you're watching this, you'll be able to go on our website and go to our participation notebook and find this under cognitive development, where we have some monkeys and we have some different caps. 
Now, one thing when you're starting the sorting is make things very different. Okay, we don't want to have all um, these different hard hat, hard caps, but just different colors. We want very, very different things. And then as a child is able to sort them, then maybe you could start doing the colors. So they're sorting those, okay? What are some other activities at home, Liz, that kids could sort for this kind of sorting and putting like things together that you could have a job maybe at home? I have my son put away the silverware. Okay, perfect. Okay, that's a reasoning skill. And can you see how we took the learning triangle and was able to view something that they had to think about? Then we read a book that had the same concept, not the same clip. We didn't watch a Cookie Monster clip. And then we did an activity. You can find lots of things, even as you're driving down the road. Can you see a red car? Can you see a truck? Can you see a train? So they can start reasoning. As you look at your activities at home, don't make them difficult, but take what they are seeing at television and incorporate it into their lives. Our next area of development that we're going to talk about is social and emotional. And this is one of the most important areas of development, in my opinion. In fact, I remember one time somebody asking me, what's the most important area of development? And as I was driving home that night from work, I started thinking about it. And I thought, you know, probably cognitive and reasoning skills are very, very important. And then I thought about all the very, very intelligent people that have created a lot of harm in our world. And then I thought about, you know, well, is social and emotional? And, you know, we do know that in the workforce that people want to make sure that they can get along. We usually can teach skills, but if we can't get along with other people, it makes it very difficult. And so this is one area of development that PBS has quite a few shows. Clifford the Big Red Dog with the Ten Big Ideas, Sesame Street, Arthur, and most of the shows will actually spend some time even Curious George, that is about science and math, still will um, talk about those social and emotional skills because it is so important. And so when you have a child that needs some encouragement, it's good to watch some of those shows to point out, well, that's how he feels, or maybe that's normal. Now, in this episode, we're talking about Super Y. And each character in Super Y has a different personality. And one of the characters is a little afraid to try new things. And so watch as the other characters help him get over some of his own emotional insecurities and they, how they help him. This slide looks oh, so high. Maybe I won't look down. I can't do it. I really want to come down the slide, but I'm too high. I'm afraid. Oh, no. What am I going to do? Hmm. This sounds like a super big problem. And a super big problem needs us, the super readers. So my question is, what can I do so I'm not afraid to go down the slide? And the answer is... Cheer! Maybe if my friends and I cheer for me, that will help me not feel afraid. We need to cheer for Pig. Say, you can do it, Pig. You can do it. You, you can, can do, do it, Pig. pig. You, you can, can do, do it. it. You can do it, Pig. You can do it. You, you can, can do, do it, Pig. You, you can, can do, do it. it. You can do it, Pig. You can do it. Whee! You did it, Pig. You did it. Let's do it again. Hip, hip, hooray! The Super Readers save the day! Wow. That's what we all need, and that's what I would encourage you to do with your children as an activity today is cheer them on in a new activity they're trying. 
Sometimes we get really discouraged. I know at my house, sometimes my children go to bed and I think, what have I done to encourage them instead of discourage them to do today? You know, the one thing that I love is there's so many incredible books about social and emotional development right now. And some of my favorite is by an author named Kevin Hinkies. And his books, um, my husband and I kid that they're children's book written for adults because they're little handbooks um, to help us along the way. Unfortunately, this book is way Way too long for me to read right now, but get it from your library. It's about a little girl named Chrysanthemum, and because her name is different, she's teased at school, and it only takes one person to make her see her self-worth. And so I would encourage you to read it. Any of the Kevin Hinkey books are such great books for you to use in your home for social and emotional development. They have a lot of different um, personalities in each of the books. Another book that I'm going to read is by David Shannon. I'll just put that down. And it's called No David. Maybe this is how I feel about my children sometime. Um, I, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this No David book. Um, I guess that David actually wrote this as an autobiography about himself. David's mom always said, no, David. No, David. No, David, no. No, no, no. Come back here, David. David, be quiet. Don't play with your food. Now talk about an imagination. <laughs> That's enough, David. Go to your room. Settle down. Stop that this instant. Please put your toys away. That's where we're talking about myelinization. <laughs> Not in the house. I said no, David. Davy, come here. Yes, David, I love you. The one thing that I want to encourage you to do is as you watch shows, not just to watch them, to incorporate that I love you in your home. It has been said that it takes um, 12 positive comments to balance out a negative comment. And so if we're always saying, pick up your room. So um, we have to do a lot of work to make sure that our children know that we care about them. But this would be a great activity then for you to write down, what do I like about you? How do I love you? And different things like that. Um, I'm sure most of you can think about the last time maybe you had an argument with a friend, a spouse, a co-worker. Did it affect the rest of your day, Pam? Does it affect the rest of your day if your, your social skills are sort of at a low? Well, certainly. And then you question yourself the next time you have a confrontation or an experience with something. Okay. Children need a lot of experience in this area. It is a very important area of development, so practice it because practice does make perfect. Our last area of development we're going to talk about today is physical development. Now this seems to be, oh, something that's going to come very easily to children. But we're seeing more and more children not have the opportunity to get out and to move and to um, develop those gross and fine motor skills. And so we want to encourage you as parents that as you watch television, that you get up and move with the television when they're moving. One thing that we've noticed from PBS and from PBS shows is that we can create a lot of experiences for children to get up and move, but most children will view it like you do probably a show where they're singing and dancing. We're watching it for entertainment. And the one thing that we're finding is if parents will stand up and model the behavior from these shows, then children will. 
If you don't, what happens is, once again, children will just sit and watch it for entertainment. So when the, the characters on the television are getting up and moving, you need to get up and move so your children were, are going to. One of, my, one of my fondest memories is coming home um, to pick up my daughter, and my mother had been watching her, and there was a particular show where they danced and sang. And to walk in and to see my mother growling like a lion and rolling her hands and looking at this two-year-old just watching her, and then that night my daughter imitating or modeling what my mom was doing. And you'll find that with your own children. Children, some of you probably can see that now, where you will do it as you watch the television and your children won't do it till later. We would really encourage that children need at least 20 minutes of physical play or physical activity every single day. That's how important it is. Most of us realize that children need 20 minutes of reading. They also need that for physical free play, where they're just able to go and jump and run and scream and laugh. So make sure that you're doing that with your children. As we watch this next clip, what I want you to do is get up and we're going to model what's on the television. And it's very easy to do. So let's get up and we're going to do Well then, let's exercise. I exercise. I exercise. It's good for me. It's, it's good, good for me. me. It makes me strong. It, it makes me strong. strong. As you can see. As, as you can see. see. I, I exercise. exercise. It's good for me. It makes me strong as you can see. I touch my knees. I touch my knees. I touch my toes. I touch my toes. I reach up high. I reach up high. And I will grow. And I will grow. I touch my knees. I touch my toes. I reach up high and I will grow. I lift my legs. I lift my legs. I run in place. I run in place. And keep a smile. And keep a smile upon my face. Upon my face. I lift my legs. Keep a smile upon my face. I move my arms. I move my arms. Around and round. Around and round. I think I might. I think I might. Fly off the ground. Fly off the ground. I move my arms around and round. I think I might fly off the ground. I'm nearly done. I'm nearly done. I have to hustle. I have to hustle. But not before. But not before. I show my muscle. I show my muscle. I'm nearly done. Show my muscle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you can sit down, take a breath. Okay, how many felt a little silly when we started? Raise your hand. But how many feel a little more energized now that you're done? We have learned over and over again when we first started out about that all areas of development are holistic. This is a perfect example of that, where children have to reason what to do to lift your legs and to smile and those kind of things. Plus, when we exercise, research has found that it releases an endorphin in our brain that makes us happy. And so physical exercise is a great example of how it affects all areas of development. As we've talked today, we've talked about all three areas of development. I'm gonna read one of my favorite physical activity books, and you don't have to do them all. We'll just play like that we have kids in the room. This is one of my favorite that I like to read with kids to get them up into moving and then to sort of settle them down. Clap your hands and stomp your feet. Shake your arms, then take a seat. Rub your tummy, pat your head. Find something yellow, find something red. Reach for the sky and wiggle your toes. Stick out your tongue and touch your nose. Roar like a lion and growl like a bear. Give me a kiss, do you dare? Wiggle your fingers and slap your knee. I'll tickle you if you tickle me. Find something big and find something small. Spin in a circle and try not to fall. Close your eyes and count to four. And a lot of times this is where we just end because the next one is now do a somersault across the floor. Spread your feet and look upside down. Make a silly face and act like a clown. Hop like a bunny and flap like a bird. 
tell me your name and how old are you? Tell me a secret and I'll tell you one too. Count your fingers and count your toes. Wiggle your eyebrows and wiggle your nose. Show me a smile and show me a frown. Stand on one foot and jump up and down. Fly like an airplane high in the sky. It's time to go now. Bye bye. You can find lots of books like this. This is one of my favorites where kids are getting up. And once again, they're not just moving, they're thinking. Um, one last activity before we close today that you have right in front of you, which will do all three areas of development because they're going to be using their fine motor skills and they're going to be finding things that they like, is on each one of these different colored papers, we would like your children to find something that represents that word. Something like soft, like a cotton ball. Hard could be a penny. Um, bumpy could be some sandpaper. Smooth, maybe some foil. Rough something that, like I said, sandpaper for bumpy, so maybe you'd have to find something else, but they're gonna have to be thinking. Then like Teresa was talking about, that cutting, that fine motor skills. You can find lots of activities and lots of shows to help with that assimilation, accommodation, to help your children take the next step to learning. As you watch shows, make sure to find ones that are at your child's age and have fun with it and move, and make sure you always tell your kids you love them.